You had me at Jello, Jello. You had me at Jello. You had me at Jello. Oh, you had me at Jello. Like, Hello, everybody. Five o'clock on a Friday. Almost time to practice all weekend long. But first, another episode of Cello Chat. And I'm thrilled to have with me today, Jonathan Ruck, Professor Ruck of University of Oklahoma. How are you doing, Jonathan? Very well. Thanks for having me, Benjamin. It's wonderful to be here. Excellent. Excellent. Would you tell our viewers about yourself, your musical background, even what drew you to the Jalo in the first place? Sure. Yes, of course. Um, well, I grew up in a musical family. I was born in Wisconsin, uh, not too far from where you are now, uh, in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, both of my parents were professional musicians, and um, it was just sort of something that we did, um, you know, starting from a very early age. I actually uh, began on the violin when I was three years old in a Suzuki program in Waukesha. And uh, I don't think I was a particularly good Suzuki violin student, um, maybe for a couple of reasons. I, uh, you know, my older brother is a fantastic violinist, and I think there was probably some sibling rivalry there that was maybe discouraging uh, at an early age, and uh, that I was frustrated by that. And then I also had some, you know, not so great um, eyesight as a child, and you know, I I found uh, holding the violin to be very difficult, or at least the way I wanted to hold it was not the way my my teachers wanted me to hold it, and that also was very frustrating for me. Um, and so. I, a long story short, I, I didn't last particularly long on the violin. I, th I mean, I think I stuck it through or was forced to stick it through until about age eight or so, um, at which point I, I took a small break. And then um, I started again with the cello um, through the public school string program. I don't actually recall um, how much parental oversight or encouragement there was in that choice. But I, I do remember, you know, the, the teacher bringing all the different instruments to the classroom and I tried the cello and I guess I thought that that would be something I could try again. Um, and so I started uh, in the public schools on the cello and uh, very shortly thereafter um, uh, started working with a fantastic private teacher in Brookfield, Wisconsin named Suzanne Hayworth. Um, I have wonderful memories of her and later studied with um, Scott Tisdall, uh, associate principal cellist in Milwaukee Symphony. Um, so that was really my my foundation uh, in Wisconsin. Um, uh, did a lot of things. Had a wonderful time playing in the Milwaukee Youth Symphony. Was already playing a lot of chamber music as a high school student and things like that. And so that sort of laid the groundwork for everything that would happen later. Right. And then your schooling. My schooling, um, well, I went to Indiana U University, um, a Jacob School of Music, for all three of my degrees, um, which is a bit odd, um, but I've, it's such a big place, and uh, I studied with a number of different teachers there during my time, and so in, in some ways it felt like going to different schools over the course of my time there. Um, I uh, did my undergraduate with uh, Tsuyoshi Tsutsumi, a fantastic uh, cellist. And then um, did my master's degree with Janos Starker, um, was his teaching assistant for a number of years, uh, two or three years, I think. And then, you know, for the kind of tail end of my studies, I actually went back and did some more work with uh, Mr. Tsutsumi, which was a nice sort of um, cap to my studies there. All right. And now you're well, and you didn't go directly from there to University of Oklahoma. I did, actually. Um, you know, I, like many um, uh, people who jump straight out of school into a job, this was a, I actually hadn't even completed my, my doctoral studies yet. Uh, and there was a one year position open here at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I thought it was going to be sort of a one year experience. And I would go back and um, finish my degree. And now it's 16 years later. And here I am. still. And so that's a certain sort of sort of the way life goes sometimes, but I'm very, very fortunate and feel very lucky to have uh, ended up here. Terrific, terrific. And in the, uh, on the journey in between, not only teaching assistant, but also concerto competition winner and chamber music competition winner, not easy, not easy um, feats. So hats off to you for those. Thank you. 
But then in your studio at University of Oklahoma, uh, I'm sure you, as we all do, have a wide variety of of students, types of students of, who have different backgrounds to with their experience in cello playing, different things that brought them to the cello. So as you know, one of the running themes, main running theme of this series is motivation. So I'm curious, what are some of your favorite, uh, basically go-tos for helping to keep students motivated to keep advancing, keep practicing, keep forging ahead? That's a wonderful question. Um, I think you know every student is is a little different, as you mentioned, and so you know part of the challenge is always sort of finding the right path uh, with every student to to figure out what best motivates uh, what what best motivates them. I um, I believe strongly in. I mean, motivation is one way to to put it, but I th I think also to feel that they're empowered. Um, what I mean by that is to make sure that I'm giving them really usable information um, so that when they leave a lesson that they, f that they feel like, um, you know, if we maybe haven't solved a problem in a lesson that they kind of know what steps they might take in the practice room, um, you know, really kind of concrete, specific things about, it might be a technical idea, it might be something to explore in a piece uh, musically, it might be, um, you know, giving them an assignment to, to listen to a certain recording or watch a certain video um, related to the topic, um, but they actually feel like they have sort of a, a plan to move forward. Um, that's just sort of on a very small scale, kind of weekly basis, I guess. And then, I mean, I think setting goals um, is very, very important over the course of a semester, over the course of a year, you know, certainly at the undergraduate level, um, most degrees have the recitals that sort of at the tail end of the degree, the first two years can be more challenging to have those concrete goals. And so we do regular studio recitals, uh, making sure that people are kind of performing as regularly in our st studio class as we can. Um, and so I think, you know, kind of, be, you know, being forced to get out there and present something as consistently as possible is really one of the most fundamental things that any of us can do, um, especially when we're when we're learning. Um, but I think going back to that idea of having students feel empowered, I, I really that's sort of the thing that I took took away from Jano you know, Starker the most. Um, it's just sort of the language that surrounds cello playing and cello technique, uh, making sure that students really are kind of aware of what they're doing and what goes into a performance and what goes into practicing and all the possible subtleties and, and varieties that we explore in our, in our music making and, and craft. Excellent. Excellent. I like that empowered and I like the focusing on goals too, because so often where motivation isn't an issue in an area in which we already have a goal in mind, you know, well, I want to get to that goal. And it's, it's kind of, once you, get to a particular goal. And if you don't then set another one that sometimes people spin their wheels a bit. And Starker sure did have a way of, like what you say, his language of talking about these things. I remember at one of his master classes, and of course I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact wording, but he suddenly in the process of working with the student said something about how it can both be dangerous to look too much just about how much you have yet to go and just or just to focus on how far you've come. But we need that awareness of, of both, you know, and you just say these things that have just always uh, stuck with me. I never got to, to study with him, but he had as much of a genius for uh, talking about music as he did for playing it, it seemed. Do you have some other kind of favorite takeaways or or from Tsutsumi for that matter? Uh, well, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a wonderful clip of him. Um, I mean, he said it over and over again. It's probably in his book too about the, um, but you can find it on, on YouTube, I think, of, of him just sort of talking about the the progress we go through over life this you know maybe is what you're mentioning is sort of uh, that you 
That's reach a certain good. point and you're now at sort of the top of a, a certain level and it's time for celebration and that's that's we, we can kind of celebrate these little mini successes but then if you at that point realize that you're on sort of the bottom of the next level then you have all this yes way left to progress is this to, to come and that's um and you know i you know, it's one of those things that you, you don't know how motivational that's going to be for a student or not to hear that because um, I do think it, it takes a certain awareness that it is. I mean, many of the things that we're um, dealing with are lifelong pursuits that it never the process never really ends. <laughs> and, you know, that that might be appealing to someone and that might be kind of daunting to someone else. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think for, for many of us, it does sort of feel like this is a life in music that, that we've sort of chosen for better or worse. And um, that's part of the part of the life. And it, you know, it's it can be sort of addicting, I think, and kind of a, a motivating thing in and of itself. But I that's, I've always found that to be very uh, motivational and inspirational, um, just that the process never ends, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's definitely something that has come up with a number of the, the people I've interviewed. And I'm sure you, I mean, just anecdotally, even before I, I started this, I'm sure you know a lot of people like this as well, in which successful cellists like yourself, who for whom I think your willingness to take the initiative to uh, start something new or to go off, you know, to, to forge some new ground, is an outgrowth of your own motivation in music, isn't it? Is it not? I think so. I, I mean, I uh, I think now more than ever, uh, students are going to be faced with leaving school and and sort of needing to forge their own path. Um, you know, I tell that to my students all the time. That um, and I, you know, I think it's you know also now more than ever important for students to be to feel competent and you know prepared to enter the profession uh, you know being able to play chamber music being able to play in a regional orchestra being able to teach being able to to build a private studio uh, being able to play recital repertoires play a concerto if they have to if the opportunity arises you know it's uh, I mean I don't really know if this was ever you know, the case, you know, we sort of speak about the past as if it was once easier than it is now. But I think, you know, certainly the prospect of kind of landing that one job that's going to be the single thing that sustains you your entire life is is not really, um, you know, that feasible for most people entering the profession. Well, so now in terms of your own path along these lines, you uh, you are very active as uh, playing solo cello, chamber music, orchestral, um, and I'm thinking in terms of your your participation in chamber music series and uh, starting chamber music groups. Are there? Uh, can you elaborate some on how your particular life story as a cellist has uh, kind of led you to forge into you know? finding these things for yourself sure yeah I, I mean for me chamber music is my real love when it comes to performing and i mean the repertoire is just so fantastic um that uh the process of, of working with others collaborating in the rehearsal process um kind of forging an interpretation and then uh, performing it there's for me there's nothing more rewarding i mean and that certainly has roots in in my past um you know that looking back i think that my chamber music experience as a young student was probably the most formative thing um for me i mean the thing that you know it, it had it, if it weren't there i it's quite possible that i wouldn't have ended up being a cellist at all i don't i don't know um, and so, you know, that started already when I was in high school in Wisconsin. I started working um, with violinists who were part of Mimi Zweig String Academy, which was then at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And we formed a, a string quartet um, that uh, was coached by Jerry Horner, who was the violist in the fine arts quartet at that time. Um, and, you know, we... 
uh, took it very seriously, and you know that was you know, he was uh, someone who encouraged us and pushed us a lot. Um, and I had never really experienced anything like that before at that time. Um, and you know, th really through that ex experience, I was kind of opened up to a, a completely different world of practicing, of 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 music making and, and you know it, it really is starting to maybe sense what it was like at the professional level to be a musician mm -hmm. um, and it's actually that quartet which brought me to indiana university it wasn't actually i mean, of course knew that the cello faculty was was fantastic but um it was sort of our plan to go and study at indiana university with uh, rostislav dubinsky um the founding first violinist of the Bordin Quartet, uh, who taught at Indiana University for a number of years. Uh, he actually passed away sort of suddenly and tragically just a few you know, weeks before we all arrived. Um, and so it, it, that plan didn't work out, but you know, we had all sort of made our arrangements. Uh, I mean, I graduated a half, I mean, a half a year early from high school to go to study there and you know, other people relocated to Bloomington. And so we, you know, we were sort of very dedicated to this group and that, you know, that, um, you know, Indiana University, as many know, is a huge school. I mean, it's some 1500 students, probably even bigger now or something. And the one thing you, you know, sometimes hear about that place is it's just a giant sea of, of students and, and it's very easy to get sort of lost in the pack. And, you know, for me as an undergraduate, that quartet really is the thing that, that probably gave me purpose in that um, kind of vast sea of, of students, you know, that, you know, we were, uh, I probably would have been a little lost without it. Um, and so that, you know, we were able to win the school's competition for a string quartet, which got us, got us out of orchestra for a year, which allowed us to rehearse very, very seriously and do, uh, you know, international competitions and things like that. And, um, and it was, it was something that I, you know, look back on with just extreme gratitude that I was able to experience that at that time, um, you know, because I now getting kind of more to the musical or even sort of just cellistic aspect of that, I think, you know, there's nothing, you know, that maybe hones our playing better than playing in a string quartet in some ways in terms of um you're able to kind of explore this incredible range of dynamic, you know, you can play softer and more subtly in a string quartet than just about in any other ensemble. Um, you know, the, the importance of intonation is just incredibly demanding that, you know, each person is so responsible for the, the sound and intonation of the group. Uh, you learn to listen to yourself in a much more critical way. Um, and then, of course, experiencing the repertoire through that that yeah. genre, which I mean, some of the just absolute masterpieces of our of our of, of all time are exist within that genre. And so, I think that for me, more than anything, that was the formative experience. And then, you know, sort of sadly, that group didn't last beyond our undergraduate years. We've all sort of gone our separate ways, and. Um, we're all kind of existing in, in music and on our own now, but, um, and so it's been sort of difficult to go back to string quartet for me, but, um, but I've sort of, you know, from that really gained an appreciation and I kind of seek out chamber music experiences whenever I can, just because I, I, I do find that to be maybe some of the most rewarding work than, that any of us can experience. Excellent. Excellent. And then this series, for example, bright music is, Am I wrong? Is that kind of the one, like Oklahoma City's answer to OK Mozart, or you know what I mean? That's yes. I mean, so, well, it's um, Bright Music is uh, a unique series within the state, in, in, in that it's you know its core members are all musicians uh, working in Oklahoma, meaning mm -hmm. that there are other chamber music series within the state of Oklahoma, but, you know, th those are primarily bringing in preformed outside groups, uh -huh. um, you know, like the OK Mozart Festival, which 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 brings in fantastic uh, people from New York and, you know, different string quartets every year. 
Um, and there's a series, Chamber Music in Oklahoma, which which does sort of a similar thing year round. There's another series in Tulsa. But uh, the idea behind Bright Music uh, and you know its founders. Uh, who were at that time faculty members here at the University of Oklahoma, at uh, Oklahoma State University, at uh, Oklahoma City University, and you know many of whom also played in the Oklahoma City Philharmonic uh, together, which was sort of to to found a series that uh, you know sort of transcended any you know allegiances to our specific schools or you know the. There's no sort of um, nothing territorial about it in any way, and so it's just uh, people who enjoy playing chamber music coming together and and, uh, and presenting six concerts a year, and we do invite guests from the outside, but primarily it's this sort of sort of core group that are working here in Oklahoma. Excellent, excellent. Well, your your comments about your love for chamber music, I am thinking of one of your performances that's on YouTube. I think what's coming to mind is is a Beethoven sonata in which, you know, and see if you agree with this or not, but there are people, there are performances of just a Beethoven and Beethoven cello and piano sonata that are more overtly collaborative, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where they sound more like they are enjoying the chamber musicness of it, as opposed to to people playing very well and, and consistently with each other. But um, I don't know, does that make sense to where they're, it sounds more like they would, they're would they playing with the pianists like they would play with the, with the string quartet, where you're doing all the things you mentioned before and also getting inside the, the, the sound, blending. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm, I'm very impressed I remember when you when you brought that up with the ensemble and the sense, you know, because ensemble is more than just being together. <laughs> yeah, well, that uh, if if we're talking about the the G minor Beethoven sonata, I think that we did during the pandemic. Um, yeah. kind of, it seems almost you know like a, a lifetime ago, but it was <laughs> back when we were all uh, wearing masks and recording things for for YouTube. Um, it was actually a really special time in some ways. I don't I don't know how you feel about it, but I mean, I think uh, in some ways it brought the musical community together in, in really you know kind of beautiful ways. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean I think specifically for cellists, I've you know um, there's just been such a nice outpouring of new content, <laughs> you know, sort of forced from this pandemic time. But um, going back to your question, sorry for the the tangent there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well I, the I, I don't mean I, I really kind of dislike listening to any of my recordings, so I don't. Uh, <laughs> I have to go back and hopefully hear what you're hearing. But I, I mean, I guess that's something I'm always striving to do. I mean, is that um, to really, you know, especially especially in a, son a sonata like that, is to um, to make it as much of an ensemble experience as you can. I mean, and especially those early sonatas, which are so, um, you know, piano driven in many ways. We're just kind yeah. of a color that sort of is along for the ride much of the time. <laughs> right, right. Excellent. Well, what are some of your projects that are coming up, whether whether concerts or or summer plans? What does the rest of 2022 look like? Um, 2022, uh, well, the, we have uh, here in Oklahoma City uh, our Bright Music Summer Festival, which is coming up. Um, uh, early June, um, playing a few more concerts with the Oklahoma City Philharmonic before that. Um, uh, big projects for the summer. Uh, it's sort of nice to be back in person for some summer teaching again this summer. Um, I'll be traveling to Fresno, California for the FUSA Festival, um, which is the Fr Fresno Summer Opera and Orchestra Academy, um, which is a great uh program uh, in Fresno. I mean, we uh, do some very ambitious repertoire. I mean, this summer, I think it's Mahler 5 uh, with the students and the faculty play along with the students in the orchestra, um, have a lot of private lessons. It's a, it's a, it's an intense two weeks, but I think everyone gets a lot out of it. And then um, back here in, in Norman in the last two weeks of July, um, the program that I 
started and uh, continue to direct the OU Summer String Academy. We'll be back in person um, for the the last two weeks of July. That's a it's a you know two week chamber music and solo repertoire festival. Um, that's you know we've been we've been canceled for the last two summers, which has been sort of sad. But I'm really excited to to do it again. Our uh, application deadline isn't until the end of May, and so I would like to to put the word out there for any violinist, violist, and cellist still looking for a summer opportunity. Um, it's a really fantastic faculty. Uh, students get a lot of um, time with the faculty, daily chamber music coachings, multiple private lessons every week. Uh, and so it's a really, I think, hopefully we've created a place that allows students to really kind of have some concentrated growth over the summer. Um, and so I'm really, really looking forward to that again. In the fall, um, I'm actually going to be on sabbatical from teaching for the first time. All right. Um, doing some performing, playing the the sixth box suite in public for the first time, which is, um, I don't, I mean, I, I, it's, again, one of those sort of lifelong projects that I feel like I've, I've avoided it long enough and I should really throw myself out there and, and do it. And, uh, you know, looking forward to that, you know, I, um, it's, that's, uh, one of the things I'll be doing over the, in the fall among some other things, but. Oh, that's such, such, such fun. I mean, like, even if we didn't have those six suites, the cello repertoire would be vast and, and absolutely wonderful, but thank goodness for those six suites too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds outstanding, and it also sounds like you won't um, you won't be bored in the rest of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Doctor Ruck. It's a real pleasure talking with you, and uh, best of luck with all your endeavors, and best of luck to you, the viewer, both this weekend and all next week until we see you again this time next Friday. Take care. In the meantime.